Hello, and thank you for joining NSBA for today's session on capital access and economic development. My name is Molly Day, and I'll be handling the back end moderation of this webinar. I'm happy now to turn it over to NSBA President and CEO, Todd McCracken. Uh, thank you, Molly, and thanks to everybody who joined us today for taking the time out of your, uh, you know, what must be really busy schedules to talk a little economic policy, capital access for small businesses, uh, and to develop our priorities. Um, uh, this is uh, the fifth in a series of six issue sessions we've had to uh, educate ourselves and to, and, to, and, to, and to get a sense of priorities for this from the small business community. Small business leaders really, it's, it's just the NSB Leadership Council that's participating in these sessions. Um, but before we get going, I want to introduce our, our 2021 chair, ML Mackey. ML is, uh, in addition to being a dynamic leader of the association, is the co-founder and CEO of Beacon International, excuse me, Interactive Systems in uh, Waltham, Massachusetts. Um, they deliver digital technology to the Department of Defense. And uh, she's been really active in the small business community for years, having been active in the small, Smaller Business Association of New England, now known as the New England Business Association, uh, the National Defense Industrial Association, and our own Small Business Technology uh, Council here at NSBA. Uh, the really refreshing thing about ML is she's she's super pragmatic, both at the business level and at the policy level, and making sure that we stay bipartisan, nonpartisan, focused on the things that really matter to the small business community and not what matters just to a, a party or a group of politicians. So ML, uh, I'm going to tell you a little more about the event and give you a better sense of things. So uh, thanks, for, everybody. Thanks for being here, and thanks for uh, leading us, ML. You are welcome. And I kind of appreciate the, the switch from Beacon Interactive Systems to Beacon International Systems, from your lips to God's ears. <laughs> I want to thank everyone for joining NSBA today and for all the future sessions you'll be joining us for. NSBA is a nonpartisan, member-driven organization with 65,000 members in every state and industry. Today we're going to ask you that all the questions be submitted through the Q&A panel, not through chat. We are leaving the chat open, but please be mindful that a lot of chat conversation can be distracting to the work we need to get done here today. So please chat expeditiously. I'll also remind you that today is not about business development or networking with each other for business development. Today is about coming together to collaborate on ideas in order to inform legislators and policymakers on the realities of the small business experience. We need to articulate what is useful and what is not in describing that experience and its legislative impacts on that experience. This is the only thing we're coming together to discuss today. For me, this is a real treat as a small business owner. I wake up thinking business development, I eat lunch having thinking business development, and I go to bed thinking about business development. So right now, in this time, give yourselves a break. Think only about how we can collaborate on the issues that are in front of us, and treasure this time as I do. Value it as a collaborative discussion in order to bring a true small business voice forward. It is and has been my honor to serve NSBA that way. It is a real pleasure to work with the board and the leadership council. I'm happy to share this time with you and my, my cohorts in kicking off this session. You've heard from Todd McCracken, NSBA President and CEO. We're going to hear from Calvin Mills, a board trustee here at, at NSBA. Before we do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Small Business Contra Congress. It happens every two years, and it's how at NSBA we decide our priority issues for the coming two years. Typically, we do this in person in back-to-back -back meetings over about a day and a half, but this year we're going to do it as we're going to do it. We are doing it as we are all doing it during these COVID times, <laughs> a digital experience in seven webinars over a three-week span. The priorities we developed today are a guiding star. They're not written in stone, and we have the ability to flex as issues as arrive, arise, but it does let us focus and, and bring all our efforts to bear in a, in a common set of priorities and agendas. So today, first we're gonna hear from experts on the issues we're talking about in this session. Then we're gonna ask questions and have time to talk about those policies and the content we've heard. Molly's gonna help us out by getting a read on how all of us on the session are feeling through some of the informal poll capability that we can do with Ring Central. And finally, at the end of the session, we're gonna vote on what our priorities should be for the next two years. I will take a moment here to let you know we have a couple of great experts lined up for us today. I'm very much looking forward to the conversation with Renee, Sam, and David, all experts in their own right. But I think it'll be a great discussion on the wide, wide range of challenges small businesses face when it comes to business finance. I will also point out that our issue committees play an important role in helping us develop and fine tune our positions as we go forward on these issues. If you wanna be involved in these committees, please reach out, email Merrill Tiemann. 
and a note on the leadership council. I, I can remember the discussions we had when we stood up this group. We created the leadership council in order to proactively and purposely bring to the board a wider and more inclusive reach across both disparate geographies and industries. It has been an overwhelmingly positive experience and we're so pleased to have all of you leadership council members with us on the call today. So with that, I thought it might be interesting for you to hear from one of our board members, Calvin Mills, about his experience previously engaging with NSB on the Leadership Council and now as a board member. Calvin is the founder, CEO, and president of CMC Technology Solutions and SLT Technology, Inc. in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It's a full-service IT consulting firm. Calvin's is the only company in Louisiana to be backed by the global company Oracle for workforce development, making him a force to be reckoned with in his field. I would argue, Calvin, you are a force to be reckoned with in any field. I so appreciate your participation on our board. Calvin has won numerous awards, ranging from the SBA's Louisiana Minority Small Business Statewide Champion of the Year to NSBA's own Small Business Advocate of the Year. He is on a first-name basis with his legislators, as we all should be, and has been a critical bridge between those lawmakers and NSBA. Calvin started on the Leadership Council several years ago and is now serving in his third year on the NSBA Board of Trustees. So Calvin, over to you. Can you hear me? Well, thank you, guys. thank you guys for having me uh, today. It's definitely and truly an honor to, to be with you all and welcome to our other members of the Leadership Council that are on this call today. Uh, Leadership Council has definitely provided a unique opportunity uh, for me and for small business leaders to be a critical link between the national policies and local elected officials, which is something that's very important to me. I've had a, a long-standing relationship with a lot of our state officials here in Baton Rouge, as well as with our congressional uh, partners in DC. Uh, Leadership Council has definitely been a pathway to even greater and deeper involvement. Uh, most of N NSBA's 30-member Board of Trustees uh, began engaging in Leadership Council immediately before being elected to the Board of Trustees. Like myself, I was approached by NSBA uh, to become a member of the Leadership Council, and I, to me, felt that it was a great honor to do that because I do have a voice and a lot of times I say I may be one person, but I speak very loud and I speak very powerfully. And I have leveraged my relationships across the board uh, on the state level as well as on the, the congressional level. Uh, the Leadership Council has a unique and exclusive opportunity, such as the forums and various media opportunities to help shape the NSBA policies. And one of the things that I'm actually doing right now, uh, myself and our CEO, Todd McCracken, uh, are working closely with my uh, congressman here in Louisiana uh, to really focus on the access to capital, which is something we're talking about today um, with that access to capital, with the EIDL and the PPP, to make sure that the people that truly need it are getting the access. Uh, I had the great pleasure of, of meeting with Todd uh, and our uh, congressman uh, about a week ago in DC to start the framework on some possible legislation that can change the narrative of how we're getting access uh, to these fundings through the EIDL and the PPP. So NSBA has definitely played a huge role in that and my opportunity to be on the Leadership Council and now a member of the Board of Trustees has really helped to shape that. And for me to bring my relationships to NSBA, I think has been very key uh, to some of the things that we're trying to get forth. I look forward to continuing my work on the board and when it's NSBA and anybody else in leadership council, if you ever have any questions or just wanted to chat and, and pick my brain, please feel free. I'll make sure that uh, Molly puts my information, contact information so that you guys can get in contact with me. But definitely, definitely it's valuable. Please get involved. If you are involved, get more involved. And I, I believe we can all have a serious voice to make some serious changes to, to better our involvement as small business owners across the country. So ML, thank you for giving me a, a small opportunity to uh, share some of my experiences and feelings uh, with NSBA and the Leadership Council and the Board of Directors. And I always, as always, I always thank you for your leadership and uh, you've definitely been a, a spark that, that I appreciate. So I'll turn it over back over to you. 
Oh, thank you, Calvin. I appreciate your kind words. And I also truly appreciate what you, um, how you approach small business advocacy. And it's one of the things that I find endemic through NSBA and you really embody. And that is that inclusive nature of, so we all have to do this. You have to do it here. You have to do it there. I have to do it on this topic. You do it on that topic. But it's this really great network that is cohesive and inclusive, Todd, that you and your staff have built over the years of, of running NSBA. And I just, Kevin, you're a great example of it. And I think you truly mean, like many don't, but I think you truly mean if people reach out to you, you'll be happy to talk to them. And it's, it's a wonderful trait about you. <laughs> and now I have the privilege of introducing Marilyn Landis to all of you. Marilyn is a, a longstanding stalwart of small business advocacy, a longstanding member of NSBA. She's the president and CEO of Basic Business Concepts Incorporated, a business that provides entrepreneurs access to affordable CFO level skills that are customized to their unique business. You are truly a friend to the small business owner who stays up at night going, do I have the money to make <laughs> the payroll? Will the lights turn on tomorrow? And you'll say, and this is how long you can turn those lights on for. <laughs> With more than 30 years of experience in financial services, including, a, including heading up SBA lending at three of the largest SBA lenders in the country, Marilyn's background in commercial banking and as a small business owner brings a unique and critical perspective of small business finance. Plus, your empathy for all of us is awesome. <laughs> Marilyn is a past chair of NSBA and has, for nearly two decades, been very involved with the organization. She's testified before Congress several times and is now serving her second appointment to the Office of the National Ombudsman Regulatory and Fairness Board. She has that experience both regionally and at a national level that we've been talking about. She brings to the table her years of experience and leaves politics at the door. Very important to the NSBA membership and approach and quality. She approaches her leadership role here at NSBA with insight, facts, and a drive to make small business ownership easier for all of us. And another aspect I like about you, Marilyn, is that you're from Pittsburgh. <laughs> I grew up and I can say, how you's doing? And you'll know what I mean. Exactly. <laughs> so with that, I'll hand it over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Elmel, very much, very much. I made some notes for this call because I, uh, this is a pet subject obviously I'm very passionate about. And if I don't stick to my notes, somebody's gonna hit the new key and cut me off. But my job here is to give you a little bit of context. And with that, uh, the Office of Advocacy issued a report on six months worth of lending that went from December of 2019 to June of 2020. Nearly all of the loans uh, increase that occurred over that period were as a result of payroll protection. The larger banks, those that were 1 billion to 10 billion, captured more market share and more payroll protection loans. But likely that's gonna be a short-lived relationship because those loans are gonna be forgiven and the forgiveness and the relationship with the small businesses are likely to fade. So it's not a lasting trend. Payroll protection put a lot of money into small business, but the government dictated the rules on how that money could be spent. So for some, it was a much, much needed lifeline. And for those, who had few or no employees, uh, they no doubt was helpful, but was it enough to do what they needed to accomplish? You know, these businesses have had to make three right now very important decisions. And again, this is giving it some context. We're a year into COVID. Do you have sufficient, do you have different customers now than you did before? Are you buying the same things? Are you seeking different products or services? What are they buying? How has the delivery of your product or service changed? And have your suppliers changed? So you have three choices at this point. You either need dollars, access to capital, to run your, way, your business the way you've always run it, stand it back up again, and hope you're still on the main thoroughfare and didn't end up on a dead end street, or you need dollars to pivot to where your customers are, to new markets where you can apply your skill set, or you need money to open a new business because closing your current one just seems to be the right choice. You no longer seems to be a market for your product. The Relief Act, Payroll Protection, and IDLE help very dramatically with the first two, not so much with the third. So what do the survivors need from policy, legislators, and regulation? In the well-intended rush to get dollars into small business bank accounts with the first run of the payroll protection, 50 years of SBA regs were waived so that they could move it faster. The result, many received uh, payroll protection that the general public feels now should not have received taxpayer subsidy. The Office of the Inspector General for the SBA issued a report in June of 2020 
on issues ranging from fraud, misuse, and ineligible receipt recipients to the program. So what's the result today? The SBA rules are back and verification is now being required. And a statistic I just read this morning, 50% of lenders are, are stating that they're seeing a 90% delay in processing the new applications because of the new rules that are in place. Again, because that was the outcry from the public, be more careful who you give the money to. The unintended consequence, I was uh, spoke to a group from the south side of Chicago, they're a chamber of commerce. It's actually making it harder for these individuals, for these minorities and underserved markets to access funding. So going forward, we need to better understand how minority and underserved markets function and what they need so we can be sure that the rules apply to them and make it easier, not harder. Traditional non-payroll protection lending uh, to small businesses pretty much sat on the sidelines during the last few months. Recently, new guidelines have been issued post-COVID for lending. They've come out of SBA, they've come out of the bankers associations. Basically, they're good credit, they're good rules. However, bankers, CPAs, borrowers haven't had to do this, this kind of reporting or this kind of analysis in decades. So it's gonna be a steep, steep learning curve. Result, survivors will find it harder to regrow their business in a new direction or to start new businesses. So the action we need is we need flexibility in the banking regulations so they can meet the needs of their communities for access to capital. Startups, believe it or not, are at an all-time record high. That's great news. But even if you have a great product, I've got a client who's booming with fishing lures because COVID's sending them to the great outdoors. However, investors have a myriad of variables they're considering. And he's finding it harder and harder to get them him to choose them for their access to capital. Result, there will be more pressure on the Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, to be less expensive and more flexible. And I was just on the phone before this call with the Ombudsman at the SEC, and that is in fact what they were thinking about, working on. So post-COVID, friends and family may have exhausted their funds. That's not an option. So the action, we need more focus on equity raise options for small business, not just lending issues when it talks about access to capital. So that's my context for this. And with that, I turn it to you, Todd. Thank you very much, Marilyn. And I think it's been a really good discussion. We have a lot to cover. We have we have three additional guests today, so I think we need to get get rock and rolling here. I'm going to introduce uh, the folks who joined us today. It's a really diverse and and I think tremendous group of people. Uh, a couple of them are going to do very brief presentations up front, and then we're going to get into uh, into a broader discussion of all these issues. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to introduce. Uh, uh, the speaker. I'll just introduce everybody at first, and then I'll I'm going to call on Renee and Sam to specifically speak. Uh, Renee Johnson, uh, who is a senior advisor in uh, at, at the Public Private Strategies, which is a firm we work with quite a bit here in uh, in DC that that, that works with uh, the Small Business Roundtable, which NSB helped uh, um, uh, found a few years ago. Uh, she worked closely with a lot of the member organizations of that group and other organizations as well. Uh, she got her start on Capitol Hill. She knows the ins and outs of the way things work up there uh, and has really focused on this intersection of, of the small business community and policy for the last for the last few years. We're really excited to have her with us. Uh, she's going to talk about some research that her uh, firm did in conjunction with some of the members of the Small Business Roundtable uh, to look at how the the, the, the pandemic and the, and the access to capital has affected uh, different communities differently. Uh, then we're going to hear from Sam Graziano, who is the CEO and co-founder of Foundation. Uh, Sam is a really innovative thinker in this whole space, uh, and I'm really pleased he could make it uh, today. Uh, his, the Foundation is a, is a really innovative uh, lender, uh, really active in the small business space, and, and they've also been a real thought leader. Uh, and we've worked with them to sort of begin to develop some policy ideas uh, for, uh, for, for the things that can happen to ease credit beyond the PPP and idle and all that stuff in the small business community. So he's going to talk about that very briefly at the top. And then uh, for those of you who were with us yesterday, you'll, you'll remember David Burton. I, we've invited David Burton to come back twice. As you know, David was general counsel here at NSPA uh, in the past, knows our issues inside and out, and he has particular expertise on uh, some of the issues around equity investing in small business and what some of the obstacles are and how those things can be smooth. So uh, we, he's gonna touch on some of those things when we get to our overall discussion. So I think the place to start though is sort of with our overall um, uh, uh, 
a survey and what that tells us about access to credit. So if Molly, you wouldn't mind sort of putting that PowerPoint up on the screen, I'm going to talk about that very briefly, and then I'm going to see if, if Renee will talk about uh, uh, their own research and what they found is happening in, in, in different communities around the country. So go to the first slide there. Uh, and uh, for those of you who've been with us before, you might have seen some of these uh, some of these information points before, and I apologize uh, for that. But I want to bring everybody up to this up to speed. Um, so we're asking people what's the what's the biggest problem they're they're facing right now, and basically it's reduced demand uh, because of the uh, the, the pandemic. Um, but they're also facing pretty significant uh, sort of internal op operational issues like uh, delays in supply chain. Um, and then managing their employees is a significant challenge. It's probably the third most significant thing um, uh, that they face right now. Let's go to the next one. Um, and when you think about the future growth and survival of their company, it really is all pandemic related. The top three are economic uncertainty, the overall pandemic, and then declining consumer spending are the top three. Uh, all of those are intertwined, obviously. Uh, but then when you go beyond that, it's regulatory burdens and access to capital. Uh, so companies are, I think, are worrying about how they can have the capital to survive, but then what kind of shape they'll be in when, we, when these things begin to turn and they begin to grow again, what kind of shape they'll be in to get the capital they need for growth and to reinvest back in their business and to, and to manage cash flow, to manage cash flow long-term. So go ahead, Molly, next one. Um, and, and again, the only thing that compares to regulatory burden in terms of the things they want Congress and the administration to do in the near term uh, is improve access to capital. Uh, so they are, are, are looking for not only improvements to the PPP, but other programs as well that can, that can be more about economic growth, not just a, a survival. Um, and let's do the next one. I think then we'll stop there and then we can move on to the um, uh, 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 other, other speakers. But we also have people thinking about long-term priorities, sort of beyond this, this moment in time. It is interesting that access to capital drops a little bit lower down the list. So I, what that tells me is that some small companies are saying this is a, is a uh, well, well, access to capital is always an issue for small companies, that this is a uniquely bad moment because it, it ranks really high in what can happen right now. But it doesn't rank quite so high in terms of, of what they're thinking about really long-term priorities being. They're, they're a little bit more focused on, you know, supplying the tax system and bringing down healthcare costs and uh, other things that are also really important. So I think that's really uh, very interesting. So, um, so why don't we go ahead and advance to, uh, to uh, Renee's slides and let's, uh, I'll, I'll, I've already introduced uh, 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 Renee, but I really thank you for being with us today uh, and, 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 and giving us a chance to sort of look at sort of the way this whole epidemic has affected different kinds of business communities. So, but uh, I won't say more about that because your, your own research was really interesting. I'd appreciate you if you just sort of give us a quick primer on it. Renee. Yeah, thanks, Todd, and thank you to all your NSBA members uh, for being a part of this conversation today. Um, so business of owners, business owners of color in COVID-19, we did a actual survey um, at the end of last year and released it on December 10th uh, as part of a public private strategies uh, initiative called Reimagine Main Street. And if we can go to the next slide, I'll tell more about Reimagine Main Street. Uh, so Reimagine Main Street is a project of public private strategy or PPS uh, and small businesses and their workers must rebound from the COVID-19 crisis. As many of us know uh, that so many communities uh, thrive and have benefits that ripple throughout the, com the community. Um, we are a multi-stakeholder cross-sector initiative focused on advancing and uplifting innovative solutions to ensure that Main Street is at the center of our recovery. Uh, we want to make sure that all businesses that are considered small um, and even micro businesses are provided some sort of relief or access to doing so. Uh, Reimagined Registry, again, is a project of public private strategies. And we can go to the next slide. 
So the context for our survey, we actually conducted this in conjunction with uh, three diverse chambers, which were the United States Black Chamber, the United States Hispanic uh, Chamber of Commerce, and National H, which is the AAPI Community Small Business. Um, we discovered basically that small businesses and communities of color, of course, were hit hard by the pandemic. Who wasn't? But we saw that there were definitely uh, some disparities within these communities uh, through our sub survey. Uh, limited data available to reflect absolute and relative experiences that are of those who identify as AAPI, Black, Hispanic, and Native-owned businesses. A large scale national survey of small business owners with large samples of AAPI, Black, Hispanic, Native, and white owned businesses provides timely insight into the impact and pain points for these small business owners. Uh, we would like to say that we think that this is probably the largest uh, survey of small business owners of color. Uh, next slide, please. And by that, I mean, <laughs> our sample size was over 8,328 respondents. Um, and as you can see to the, I guess, the right side, maybe it's the left of your screen, I don't know if it flips. Uh, we definitely saw um, an increase in small business owners who wanted to get this data out there and were able to provide sort of their responses to the survey. Um, and if you notice, uh, we did have a very large population of um, communities of color that uh, completed this survey. So we're really excited about that. Next slide. Um, some of the takeaways that we have from this survey particularly was that, you know, we, again, new small businesses were hit hard, but eight out of 10 small businesses uh, who were surveyed reported that they had negative effects from the pandemic with more than half of them experienced revenue declines of more than 25% uh, percent, and 37 are not operating at full capacity. Um, and on average, almost 10% closed. Um, and I think that's relative to what you guys saw in your survey as well. Uh, many are experiencing a decline in revenue. Uh, COVID-19 has really impacted their business and their bottom lines, uh, inability to be successful and thrive. It's actually getting worse for business owners um, and their employees. And we wanna make sure that we understand what employees are going through. Uh, when you talk about small businesses, uh, it's really hard to separate employees from the management or owner. And the reason being is there's a strong intersection there of their employees are usually themselves because they're um, sole proprietors or they're an only employee, they employ themselves or they employ their family or immediately community around them. So it has a huge impact. 10% uh, of small business respondents expect to close permanently uh, in the next six months. So this survey, again, was conducted in December of 2020. So we have know for sure that some of these respondents to the survey uh, have sadly closed because we are now already three almost three months out. 44% um, of employer businesses that have responded have already shed jobs and 45% expect more job losses to come. Um, it's really sad to see this, but we do know that this is an issue. Um, and it, having some sort of access to capital is very important in order to play, pay their employees, but also uh, with certain restrictions, some businesses uh, had to actually permanently close and or close, um, and some of their employees can go and obtain some sort of unemployment benefits uh, due to restrictions that were in different states. Uh, small businesses need cash, and yet again, um, we know that the PPP, uh, there were many issues of it with it, uh, people obtaining it, getting access, uh, but more specifically, there were a large number of small business owners who didn't take a PPP loan because the word loan, and especially communities of color, uh, loans are, are sort of uh, hard to get. Uh, if you didn't have a uh, connection with a bank or you had certain parameters that met the qualification for that specific bank to apply, you weren't eligible to do so. Uh, and we do know that relationships with banks and persons of color uh, is not at the greatest level and need, more work needs to be done in that space. Next slide, please. So as we mentioned before, uh, revenue is down um, by 25% for most respondents. Um, the change in revenue, as you see from 2020 to 2019, uh, and the percentage of those 
for those communities. And as you see, with, for example, with communities of color that are black, uh, we had over 2,208 respond. Uh, and you could see that the greater proportion of their revenues being great uh, and more than 25% is huge. Uh, and this is telling to show that many business owners need more uh, access because they're not having it being generated by their everyday uh, businesses. People are not able to use those establishments. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we, again, are expecting to see more businesses shut down. You know, on the onset of, of this uh, presentation, we discussed that and we we're saying, you know, we're going to see only more of that. And again, cash crisis, crisis without relief is very important to note. Many of these small businesses cannot thrive, cannot succeed, cannot pay their workers, cannot pay their bills. And it's because they have lack of access to that capital. Um, next slide, please. And then we also have more jobs that are going to likely shed within this time. Um, four in, out of 10 small business employees uh, have already shed jobs. Um, that's a huge number. And that's also uh, what we're seeing in the economy because spending is down. Um, I think we even saw within the NSBA survey that this was a huge issue too because it immediately uh, impacts not only the employer, the small business, but the community and its workers as well. And I think there's one more slide. Yes. Um, imperative to maintain liquidity in credit market. Uh, more than half of the respondents say they will need financial assistance or additional capital in the next six months. And as you all know, uh, Congress did finally um, do another package. However, we're seeing that not a lot of people are going for that PPP, this sort of like second uh, re refill of the PPP. Uh, again, because a lot of the issues of obtaining that access have not changed, right? Um, the way and mechanism to get a loan is still the same. And many small business owners are making that hard decision. Um, if I have to take out a loan, do I need to stay in business? Because will I ever make enough money back to pay back that loan? Um, there are more than one third of small businesses expect to borrow to address COVID-induced cash flow constraints. Um, but that's still not enough, right? We know that there are many businesses that are now gonna close because of lack of uh, access and liquidity. And so we'll never see those businesses again. And now we need to actually start looking at this, looking at the data and trying to provide solutions, uh, especially with cash injection of some sort of grant program uh, to these communities. I think that's the last slide. Thank you very much for that. It's an excellent presentation, excellent uh, and very interesting survey results. Um, it gives a lot to think about and talk about. Uh, so I, I'll introduce Sam Graziano now. I've already introduced him before, uh, 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 co-founder and CEO of Foundation. Um, and Sam's done a lot of thinking about what we can do to release out some of these problems. So uh, Sam, maybe you can sort of jump in and just talk about how, how you see the credit market for the small business community right now and what are some of the innovative things we can do to make it better. Sure, and first of all, thanks, thanks for having me. So maybe uh, before I get into that specific question, I'll talk a little bit about you know who I am and, and okay. where, I'm, where I'm coming from on this issue. So uh, as Todd mentioned, uh, I'm the CEO of a company called Foundation. Um, Foundation does two things. Uh, the first thing that we do is we actually offer our technology to many of the leading banks in the United States to offer various forms of small business credit. So in a number of these institutions, when you approach them, whether through, it, uh, through a banker or through their website, and you decide to apply for credit, it, it's our underlying technology that is powering that. Um, and then the second thing we do is also as a, an originator of loans ourselves, that's actually the, the founding of our company was predicated on providing a, 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 a great solution to small businesses when banks weren't available or, or weren't willing to lend, but that was better than the others that were in the marketplace. And so by virtue of those, those two, different cap um, two different businesses that we're in, we have a lot of visibility into what's going on on the ground in terms of um, small businesses, both demand for and access to credit. 
And what I would say is, um, and, and I think some of the slides that we just went through, I think do speak to this is, you know, there is, it, there, there's some, there does seem to be just given all the concern around the, the economic recovery and the pandemic, there is a little bit of a reticence to, to pursue uh, credit in the current environment. I think just out of a nervousness is, okay, if I take that loan, you know, what if I'm not able to pay it back um, by virtue of just the, the market very, being very soft? Um, and so we are seeing, at least through the, the, the areas where we operate and with the institutions we operate, some reduced level of demand. You know, and I think PPP also has an, has an influence on that as well. And obviously, for those of you and for those that you know, understand you know, the, the, the real benefit of PPP, you know, yes, it is a loan, um, but it's a loan that if you meet the, the criteria um, with respect to it, you don't have to pay it back, right? So it is effectively a grant. So it's a phenomenal form of capital. Um, if you're eligible and if you use the proceeds correctly um, versus a loan, a, a real loan where you'd actually have to pay that obligation back. And so, you know, during the two different waves of PPP last spring uh, and then, then again, you know, earlier this year, um, you know, we really saw demand through the institutions that we were working with um, be very, very tepid um, while PPP was working its way through the system. And we're starting to see that, you know, wear off in, 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 in the current environment. But the reality is, this is probably one of the most difficult environments in history, if not the most difficult environment in history for conventional lenders um, to lend confidently, right? Because it's very hard to discern whether or not a, a, you know, one business is credit worthy versus another in an environment that is so uncertain. Um, and so what we're seeing is, you know, banking institutions are probably more conservative than they've, they've been for many, many years in terms of the amount of capital and their approval rates for customers that are coming through the door. Um, and it's for, you know, for somewhat of good reasons, right? There's just a lot of uncertainty out there. Um, and so in one of the areas, there's really a couple areas where our company is sort of trying to advance some policy that we think can help. Um, and what Todd has up is one slide, which I'll go through in a moment, which is, you know, we do believe that there are public private partnerships, um, you know, with the public being the government and the private being the banking system and private lenders that can meaningfully accelerate the, the, the amount of capital that's coming into the market for small businesses um, and do it in a way where it, it's sort of a win-win-win for everybody. Um, and so I'll walk through those mechanics in a second in terms of how, you know, we think this could be impactful. The other area where, you know, we try and invest some of our time around policy is around uh, the concept of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And so you're probably saying, well, what does that have to do with this? Well, um, the, the, the reality is for small business lending, for the most part, banking institutions and private lenders use models and algorithms to, to extend credit, um, which means, you know, there's not somebody necessarily in the back office that is looking at every file and studying it in detail and, and doing an extensive due diligence process like they would for a large commercial loan. And the reason for that is should be obvious, which is that would be very costly to do, given that the average size of a small business loan tends to be in the order of magnitude of fifty or $60,000, um, and in some cases even smaller. So most lending institutions in this market use models, um, or they use data to be able to do that. And one of the promises of artificial intelligence and machine learning is you can make those models smarter. Now, the problem is, you know, with, from a regulatory perspective, um, using models where it's hard to explain the outcome doesn't, co you know, doesn't live very well with some of the regulations around lending. And, the, and, you know, we know that many government agencies understand this, and there's a lot of work going, going into okay, how do we change the dynamics for banks and other, and, and other non-banking financial institutions to confidently use these advanced st statistical techniques for the, better, for the betterment of consumers and small businesses? And so that's one area where we're trying to be impactful. Um, what you see on the page here is we worked with Todd and his team um, to advance this, this, this policy item with the Federal Reserve. Um, where we believe that there is ultimately going to be an enormous demand for capital, and I think it's going to happen over the next many months, you know, as the pandemic as starts to subside and businesses become a lot more confident to invest. And when that happens, we want to be sure that banks 
and the and other reputable lenders can be positioned to confidently lend into the market where there still may be some more level of uncertainty than they would typically face. And so the way we think that can be done is through a public-private program between the Federal Reserve and, and lenders, in particular the banking institutions. You know, there's obviously the SBA um, today, and the SBA continues to play a very important role. Um, and, but we do think that there is a way where the impact of a public-private program with the Fed can be even bigger and simpler. Um, in particular, what we mean is we think it should be constructed in a way where banks can use their conventional lending programs. And what I mean by conventional is when, you, when, when, it, when a small business applies for a loan or line of credit, there's sort of the standard products that a bank would offer, which are generally a revolving line of credit or an installment loan that don't come with the sort of additional paperwork that would come with the SBA programs. Um, and to be able to, by, and by virtue of using those conventional programs, it means it would be a lot easier on the small business owner and a lot easier on the banking institution to be able to do this at scale at the level at the levels of demand that we think are going to be warranted. And the way we align interests between the private sector and the public sector is by giving the banks that are extending credit through this program a limited backstop or a limited guarantee that would burn off over time, um, over years, as they continue to provide liquidity to that same small business that came in the door in the early days. Now, there's a, there's a lot to this, um, but we do think you know, the way we've constructed it um, and the way we are um, um, uh, proposing it to be designed can be both simple, again, simple for the, for the small business owner and simple for the institutions that want to participate and can have a massive impact. Now, one of the things that we've been pretty vocal with respect to this policy item, and I, and I heard this come up in the, in the prior presentation around the idea of getting a loan and, okay, if I get that loan, I need to be able to confidently know that I can pay it back. And so one of the things that we feel strongly about is that business owners should usually be pursuing lines of credit when, when they're available, right? Now, many non-bank lenders offer term products, term loan products. Um, not all of them offer lines of credit because they tend to be harder to administer and manager and, and, ma and manage. But banks, by and large, you know, the, the primary product that they're offering in the market is a line of credit. And, and why do I feel strongly about that? It's because when I read these surveys, and I saw it earlier in, in, in the prior presentation, it is one of the challenges that, that many of you face and, and, and other small businesses face is just that ongoing imbalance between when you have to spend and when your revenue is coming in the door, right? That constant cash flow, uneven cash flow that affects your liquidity. Well, what a line of credit can do is allow you to draw that money when you need, pay it back as soon as you can, draw it again when you need it, pay it back as soon as you can. So you don't have to take all the money at once and start paying interest on that lump sum. And so it generally dovetails very well with the, with the needs of a business owner. Now, term products tend to be the most impactful when you have a, a large purchase you need to make, whether that is equipment or you need to make a one-time, you know, some capital improvements or you want to hire a whole bunch of people at once or do some marketing or what have you. There certainly are a lot of use cases where you need that one large one-time sum of money and you want to be able to spread those payments back over a much longer period of time. And so our, our policy on this item was very vocal on that exact, that exact issue, which is we want to make sure that this program, if we're successful in getting it implemented, serves the needs of, of, of business owners that really have liquidity challenges and those that need to make longer term productive investments in their business. Um, so, you know, the only other, the other thing I'd add is, look, I, I would say from our vantage point, you know, banking institutions, their, their doors are not closed. They are more conservative. Um, but I, I, I don't think business owners should ever be worried about what if the bank says no, big deal, right? You know, banks never say it yes 100% of the time. It's an impossibility when it comes to credit because you're lending money, right? But by and large, there's, there's no real impact to you if the bank says no. Now, just a little commercial for us and, and, and just sort of, you know, hopefully this could be helpful to some of you that are listening. Um, in what we do, where we offer the banks we work with technology, we also offer them what we call a second look option, which is 
you know, our, our products that we brand in the name of foundation um, can say no sometimes when banks say, can say, sorry, can say yes when the bank says no. And so some of the institutions that are in your markets um, that, you know, that we, where we offer that capability where you can apply through the bank and potentially get a, if the bank isn't able to do it, we might. Um, those would be Citizens Bank in the Northeast, Fifth Third in the Midwest, Bank of the West in the West in California, uh, Associated Bank in Minnesota, Bank United in Florida, and Provident Bank in New Jersey. Just you know, for those of you that are, are really considering this in the near term and want to see see if you can go through a route where you can get the best possible option. So I'll stop there, Todd. If there's anything else you think I should talk about, um, or if there, if we should take questions, I'm I'm happy to do it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm sure we'll get to some things in the Q and A. Uh, I want to get things down. Turn things back to Marilyn real fast. She has questions, but first, I want to hear a little bit from David Burton and what he thinks the opportunities are in sort of in the whole equity arena. If we can shake loose some reasonable regs from SEC or or anything else uh, this next year or two, David. Oh, you're still muted, David. There you go. Okay. <laughs> There's been some improvement uh, at the SEC over the past 12 to 18 months. Uh, they made some improvements in December. Uh, they took their time, but uh, in December, with respect to uh, crowdfunding, increasing the limit to $5 million, and also uh, making the rules slightly less complex, they increased the limit for Regulation A to 75 million and made the rules slightly less complex. <clears throat> they substantially improved the so-called integration rules, which enable you to determine if you're doing a series of, of offerings, whether they're one big offering or uh, two different offerings. And that matters because these things have dollar limits and time frame limits. Um, <clears throat> then they also, somewhat broaden the definition of accredited investor. Regulation D is a safe harbor under the private placement offering uh, and approximately $1.7 trillion a year is raised uh, through Regulation D. Most of the time, the people investing in Regulation D offerings have to be accredited investors, which can be financial institutions or individuals with a residence exclusive net worth of a million dollars or more, or for a couple, an income of $300,000 or more. Uh, there's also this concept in Regulation D, if you're quote sophisticated unquote, you could also make the investment, but the SEC never got around to defining what that means, so most people ignore it. Uh, under that idea, they're treating as accredited, uh, presently registered reps who work for broker dealers, uh, registered investment advisor representatives, and then there's a catch-all category that certain other kinds of certifications could qualify as accredited if you apply to the SEC, so like certified financial planners and, and so on down the line. Uh, in principle, we should be able to broaden that dramatically to include people that have certain educational attainment like an MBA or a graduate degree in finance or entrepreneurship, uh, people who pass a test demonstrating investment knowledge, CPAs, and so on down the line, and hopefully we'll eventually be able to do that. Uh, that's on the to-do list. Um, so those are some positive steps that have happened recently. Uh, there's also a finder is someone that a small businessman might pay 2% to to make an introduction to a, a potential investor. About 20 years ago, the SEC yanked all the guidance saying that was okay gave a bunch of speeches saying they're gonna chase anybody who's a finder as an unregistered broker dealer. Uh, but they never actually passed or promulgated any rules saying what is and is not a finder, what is and is not a broker dealer. Uh, finally, 20 years later, they got around to proposing a rule uh, in the fall. And uh, they, they saw comments, a uh, number of people have commented, including myself, uh, but uh, there's no longer uh, a majority to get that done. So we may end up having to work through the Congress. Congressman Budd has legislation that would allow finders to help small businesses uh, raise capital. Uh, he's on the House Financial Services Committee. Um, but that unfortunately uh, is probably not gonna get solved in the near term, even though it could be important to a lot of businesses who live in communities where there aren't a lot of people 
with high net worth or high incomes. Uh, <clears throat> there is some hope uh, that we will eventually be able to fix some of the problems in equity crowdfunding or Title III crowdfunding, so-called. Uh, it's currently m much too complex for small the smallest businesses who can raise uh, a few million dollars or a few hundred thousand dollars or a few tens of thousands of dollars because the reporting obligations on a continuing basis are too high. One thing that we could do in that area is uh, create a sort of bare bones version of equity crowdfunding for debt so that it could become more of a peer-to-peer -peer lending type uh, area for small businesses seeking to borrow money, not necessarily uh, seek equity capital. Again, the SEC is the culprit here. Once upon a time, Lending Club and Prosper did peer-to-peer -peer lending to small businesses, but the SEC jumped them, basically saying every $10,000 loan to a small business requires a registration statement, which involves spending a million dollars on lawyers. So the SEC shot that down. We need to try to fix that. There are a lot of other things we could do to improve the ability of small businesses to raise capital using either Regulation D, Regulation A, crowdfunding, or other mechanisms, uh, but I think we're time constrained, so I won't go into all that right now. Thank you, David. Well, we have a bunch of questions we to get to, but Marilyn, I want to just let you jump in and see if there's anything, any, any uh, overall uh, thoughts you have or questions you want to ask anybody before we get to the... I've got three comments. Uh, first, well, it's four, actually. Renee, the data you had is wonderful. Because what I am finding, the more I work with this, is often where one rule is passed has made it impossible. We've made it even harder for a minority to go to the bank for the first time because the banks now have to report any new account that opens and money shows up shortly thereafter. So we've intensified that fear. Two good rules, but together, they've made it worse. Um, Sam, you are spot on with what, you, and I know we've talked about that before, uh, with the, what the small business needs and how to go about getting it. Um, the other fact that I'm sure you see with your banks is the banks know what they're, many of them know what their community needs. They're gonna to have to deal with the regulators. I do a little bit of bank portfolio review with colleague and they're terrified of the regulators. The bank president can be fired and there's no court that will hear an appeal if they don't like the, the review of the loan portfolio and that's gonna be after the fact. So they're afraid of that happening six, nine, 10 months from now on a loan that was made in the heat of COVID. So we need help with that. Dave, equity, you're absolutely right. You know, where do you go if you need that patient capital that an investor gives you? If you're not in the East Coast or you're not in Silicon Valley, and you talked about the finders, it's exactly, we need those bridges to those, that expertise to be able to get that. Most communities that are not on one coast or the other don't even think about how to go about equity. They make it their uncle or their friend to give them money, not even thinking if they're running afoul of an SEC regulation. And crowdfunding for lending, absolutely. There's a few that have skirted some of the rules, haven't quite doing small things, and it's powerful. Crowdfunding lending is a supreme way, and Renee, to your survey, where minority communities can support each other. It's a way for them to come together around a business because they know the business, they know the individual. It's much the way credit union started in this country, or savings and loans started in this country years ago with German immigrants. Mm -hmm. They came together and lent each other money. And you better pay it back because everybody knew you and you knew everybody in that group. So those are my feed on this. I think these are important initiatives. Thank you all. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, Jody Milanese, who's our Vice President for uh, Government Affairs, has been kind of monitoring the Q&A uh, that's been coming in, or the, or the questions that have been coming in. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask her if she will uh, sort of uh, moderate that and let us know what are some of the key questions that uh, we should begin to answer now. Jody? I see you're on mute, by the way. Oh, she's gone away. Something has happened. I'll try to moderate the questions. There's <laughs> been a number that have come in about uh, um, uh, PPP loans uh, potentially being exempt from different things. Can we get it? Uh, you know, uh, let me see if I can read this. Well, I'm going to skip that. because that's, that's way too complex for me to digest in a, in a quick um, moment here. Um, there was one where someone was asking about idle loans. And I don't know if anyone has a view on this or has any knowledge of this, but uh, 
we know folks can't get a second idle loan, but can they get uh, an increase in the idle loan they already have? Apparently there's a provision that would allow them to, but does anyone have a sense that the SBA is actually allowing that? Uh, are they actually allowing folks to increase their loans? Marilyn, do you have an answer? Yeah, uh, technically they're allowed to because the idea behind the idle loan was that it was meant to be for a disaster. So initially you thought you only lost the roof on your building. You find out it's the foundation so they could advance mm -hmm. more money to do that. I don't know that the SBA has yet crafted a criteria to judge whether or not you're eligible for that second piece. But one of the important things for everybody to know is if they apply for an idle loan and they got less than the $10,000 initial grant, those people are now being contacted by SBA saying, supply the information. And under if you meet, there's three rules they have to meet. If you meet those, we'll pay you the rest of that 10,000 and that's a grant. Right. So for many businesses, that's good. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, uh, um, some of our membership have actually been contacted um, about that. And they're actually worried about what's the next step on tax filings and what does that mean? Because I'm getting the year money in FY21 versus 2020. So I always tell people, don't worry about that right now. Worry about saving your business. Um, yeah. There will be more policy changes in 2021 uh, tax filing season, so worry about that later. Just plan to, to survive at this time. Well, the law that passed in December made that non-taxable. Right, so. but I'm saying like the funds that would actually, some people were just confused, like what does that mean? And then going into the next tax season, right. if the funds come delayed within, say, 2022, what does that mean for 2021 and 2020 tax filings? So, yeah, agreed. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the, and I said the confusion is there. It's real. Uh, there's no question about it. But the law did specify the source of the funds, not the tax year. So that's helpful. Yeah. I think this is a question that I think is for Sam. Uh, uh, Tamika Montgomery asks basically, uh, how, the, while the AI technology might help improve and make much more efficient small business lending, but how do you build in those safeguards so you don't make so you make sure you're not unintendedly being biased against certain kinds of businesses or or uh, other things like that? How's, how does that work, and how can we be? I think that's what you meant by running afoul of potential regulations. But yeah, that's, it, that, that's exactly that? what, exactly. I mean, that's exactly what stands in the way or, or, or well, there's what stands in the way of two things, right? There is, there's, there is a certain regulations, one called regulation B, which is you have to have a mm -hmm. specific reason that you give a customer as to why that loan was declined. Now the problem with black box models is it's not always just, Hey, it was this, it was, right. Um, um, you know, you're too short or you're too tall or type of thing, right? It could be right. some combination of things that right. is hard to explain. And that's one issue that regulators understand and they're working through. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the other part of the question? I think there was a second part of the question. Oh, how do you not, right. And so look, any, um, any, any banking, any regulated institution or really any lender that is deploying algorithms in the market right? It, part of the model development process should be sort of testing outcomes, right? Because there are laws around disparate impact, disparate treatment, right? With respect to uh, extending credit as well. And those have to be taken into account as you're, as you're developing these models. Okay, thanks. Uh, and this actually isn't one question, but it was something I wanted to raise because this is an important part of this session too. And, and that is, um, you know, an important backstop for a lot of companies that may be struggling in the private marketplace is the maintenance of some uh, procurement contracts that it has, especially with the federal government, state governments. So uh, what does that world look like? I mean, there's lots of bias against small companies in the procurement world right now, has been for years. Um, is there any reason to believe that we can make some changes uh, that can improve things for small companies, make it easier for them to make sure they're getting their fair share of contracts? If there's an infrastructure bill, for instance, that's a huge procurement opportunity for lots of companies and an ability for them to grow their businesses in a way that, you know, makes them more eligible for this capital and so forth. Uh, Renee, do you have any perspective on that? Yeah, um, the uh, nominee, uh, Isabel Guzman, to be the SBA uh, new administrator, she actually is focused on that and more particularly with the AA program, uh, which is designed to help more minorities, women, own businesses become uh, contractors to the to, to the government. Um, she has made comments where there needs to be some sort of uh, program solution based restructuring of the application process. Uh, additionally, ensuring that the agency is making its metrics uh, and ensuring that they're saying, "Hey, we're going to try to aim for." 
4% minority contractors within the procurement and contracting uh, world to the government. Well, for many years, they don't reach it. I know a couple years they reached their goal for women-owned businesses, but outside of that, from disabled to economically disadvantaged, they really do not make that goal. And so there should definitely be some sort of oversight that's conducted with the small business committees on both the House and Senate side that work to really, really, really find solutions to how these programs at the agency work. Uh, because if they're not working, they're not getting to the right people, they're not getting to the right people who are then unable to be part of that procurement and contracting process. Process. Thanks. Hey, Mel, so, do you have a yeah, I do. So when you talk about federal procurement, oh, I froze. Oh, there we go. When you talk, <laughs> when you talk about federal procurement and access to capital, one of the things that I know that folks that work in the defense space often find is when you want to act on, um, say you don't have the assets, say you're a software company or, or something that doesn't have assets to put up on a typical kind of a, a credit line, and you want to use the contracts that you have with the federal government that you know are coming in, that you know are consistent, you can't leverage them the way you can a lot of other contracts. Often you're a subcontractor to someone else, so you can't take a loan out based on the committed contract. So I, I think being thoughtful about how we provide access to capital and all our unique characteristics, including what type of um, contracts you have, would be really helpful to our federal contracting community. Well, and even going to that point, um, it's also difficult to even do the application process to go through that. And especially in the defense contracting world, um, it can be very cumbersome. There's a lot of paperwork one needs to have in order to get through the process uh, to even be SAM eligible, right? Um, and so how do we get that technical assistance to small business owners? Even the smallest small business owner should be, have the ability to apply to be a contractor to the government. It shouldn't be because I have dozens of lawyers and hundreds of millions of dollars in order to invest and to be a part of that process. And so how do we simplify that, that process to be more inclusive of small business owners um, from across the country, from all different spectrums that can be a part of this process as well? Yeah, so I think it's the, the funnel in as you're talking about, Renee, and it's also the unique characteristics of um, your contracting situations once you're in there that don't necessarily let you leverage a lot of the typical access to capital for an ongoing business is actually the other piece too. Marilyn, you had something and then I'll hand it yeah, back to Yeah, because I think we, there was a, a SBA program that we worked hard to get a real life put back into it during the recession to speak exactly to what you all are talking about, the contract financing. It's been around as an SBA program for a very long time. We got somebody to stand it up for us at SBA and the banks refused to use it for a couple of reasons. They didn't know how, they didn't know how to do the contract lending. We now have FinTech folks who do understand how to do the contract lending. Perhaps they'd be interested in that program. We need to push SBA again. Or we have banks who are, as Sam so wisely put, they've been a little tepid with their lending, but this might be an SBA program that they could embrace with some guidance because you have to have been around in banking as long as I've been around to understand how you do that kind of stuff. But it's one we may want to push for, a, a regulatory push. And to that end with contracting, Todd, Jody and I had a little, and Molly and I had a little back and forth on one of the questions in the Q&A. And I didn't have a direct answer for it, but it, the answer I have could be valuable to other government contractors. Okay. There are intersections of government contracting rules, particularly if there's any kind of discounts and so forth, and payroll protectness forgiveness rules. And in some industries, the question in particular had to do with transportation, Department uh, DOT. Where there is an intersection of those two that you cannot benefit from payroll protection, that's exactly where the Office of the National Ombudsman, you can go online, sba.gov backslash ombudsman, complete a comment form, let them know that your problem in this case would be SBA and D Department of Transit, if that's it, what the issues you're finding, and ask for relief from that regulation as applies to your use of payroll protection. They do have access, don't, they're housed at SBA, but they have access to them and to the highest level of all the agencies. If enough people raise the issue, they're likely to get a one-time exception so that, because they were not meant to conflict. All right, we've got a bunch of questions and I think, I think Molly's going to ask us some of them now. Uh, well, maybe Jordy's back. She's, uh, Jordy's having computers. She's related to the weather where she happens to be right now. So she had to got kicked off before, but we have a bunch of questions. So if, if, the, if the panel's all right, hang on just for a few more minutes. I'd like to get to a few more things. That's okay with folks. Um, all right, Great. Molly. 
the first question I have is from Michael, and he asks, and I think this is a question for you, David, is there any question of raising the Reg D limit? Current limits are fine for certain sectors like tech, but not for others like manufacturing or energy. Well, Regulation D uh, has two rules. 506 uh, doesn't have a dollar limit, and that's the one that's most commonly used because it's the least regulated. Five, it's rule 504 uh, was recently increased to $5 million. So there has been, uh, in the, about a year ago, uh, an increase on that, but the vast majority of the money, by which I mean 96%, is used raised in regulation, uh, regulation D, Rule 506, and that uh, doesn't have a dollar cap. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I apologize if you all already addressed this, but one question was um, kind of touching back on idle. And do you do you foresee any kind of extension on the repayment of that program? Marilyn, do you want to take that? Yeah. Oh, it's already being paid back. Idle loans are paid back over a 30-year term. Long time. Which is extraordinary for money that isn't used for a hard fixed asset. So I don't think you'll see. Well, you may see some leniency. Uh, defer, you know, deferrals and other issues if the business runs, runs into trouble, but I don't think you'd see them extending it beyond a 30-year term. That's an extraordinary long time for a loan. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay. I have another question here from Mark, and he asks, what, if anything, is being done to adjust, adjust credit risk analysis protocols to deal with businesses that are no longer credit worthy due to COVID-19? Many of these businesses do not comply with the credit worthy standards that lenders currently use. I'll take that one. Uh, I've read the regs. And uh, SBA and the Credit Risk Management Group, which is RMA, have been trying to address this. They've been trying to have, that's where I talked about the kind of analysis they're going to do. They're, they're to address things like what your supply chain looked like, what was your disruption, what was the impact of COVID, where are you going forward, who are your customers. It, it's a projection kind of lending and trying to move away from the heavy reliance. Some small community banks don't even use credit reports anymore because they were too heavily criticized by the regulators when they came in and saw a bad credit report. I've done bank reviews where there's no credit reports anymore. But they've had to move away from that underwriting for a lot of the reasons you, it became, that started after the recession when good people had had a bad hit and then were recovering. But they were going to start, they're telling us the banks are going to start looking at internal financial statements and not just annual yearly tax returns. But most small businesses have not invested the money to have strong internal monthly statements because nobody ever bothered to ask for them or read them before. Right. So there is an attempt in banking to get it there. The concern of the bankers, if we follow these new rules, just as the problem Sam has with outcomes for AI, if we follow these new rules and it looks as if we're somehow discriminating, are we gonna get in trouble? And they're very reluctant to make the change. So we need regulatory cover, we need agency cover, we need legislative cover to give them a chance to do know how, the lending they know how to do. As, I mean, it's a key question. The credit reports, you're absolutely right. Pull the credit report on the person who owns 20 or 30% of the company, and if they drained their savings and did everything they could to survive, that credit report isn't gonna look pretty anymore. So I'm um, Sam, I know deals with us to talk about a second look. He deals with us with the banks a lot. We need a system-wide change, and that's going to take uh, at the Reg Fair Board and uh, the Ombudsman's Office, we're running working capital groups with bankers trying to find out what their issues are so we can help them. Yep. Any thoughts on that, Sam? I, those are phenomenal points. I, the only thing I'd, a, I'd add is, look, it, it behooves every business owner to, to monitor your credit, right? Both. And, and, I, and I think most people just think about that through the lens of my consumer credit. But many of you have, whether you know it or not, commercial credit reports as well with a number of agencies. Um, and you know, there are services out there to, to look at that. Th there are also services out there to uh, rebuild or, or establish credit. Um, and, and I think you know, there, there is a company that, that is really unique on, on the consumer side called SelfLender, where you can actually almost like take out a loan that, is sort of cash secure to start building positive payment history with with a, with a credit bureau, and on on the on the business side, the best thing to do is to, to get a, if you don't have one is a business credit card, because that business credit card, even if you've got a small line on that business credit card, 
showing positive payment history that gets reported to um, small business credit reporting agencies, you know, like, you know, like Equifax, like DNB, like uh, Paynet, which is now owned by Equifax, Experian, et cetera. There's commercial, remember, there's commercial credit bureau as well. And, you know, lenders look at both. And so I think it's, you know, you really want to make sure that you use the, you know, for, first of all, look at your reports and, and, and if there's anything that seems off, dispute them and try and get them corrected. But then other find simple ways to uh, establish credit history or to rebuild credit history. Thanks. Molly, maybe one more question. We can let people, let people go. Yeah, we, we've got a couple of questions about the unique situation nonprofits find themselves in. Um, they're asking if you have any specific advice in terms of getting lending and, and working through the PPP or EIDL. If you're a nonprofit organization, is there anything specific to those kind of, of, of businesses? I can speak to that if you want me to. Uh, sure. You need to find a lender who is comfortable with nonprofit lending. Uh, they're looking at different things, obviously, than your cash flow profit to be able to repay that loan. But there are a number of banks who have divisions that work in nonprofits, and they will know how to work with you. They know how to do, deal with grants that they see on your financial statements. Uh, the payroll protection allows you to borrow from the, for the employees in a nonprofit. And there are some exemptions around some of the affiliation rules in there. So spend some time with somebody who understands nonprofit lending and, and or get my contact information out. I'd be happy to talk to somebody. I do a lot of work with nonprofits as well. I'd be happy to explain that in more detail. All right. Well, I think uh, we'll sort of wrap up our panel discussion for now. I want to thank uh, Sam and David and Renee very much for joining us today. We really appreciate your, uh, your insight and expertise. And uh, we'll stay in touch. We're going to share your contact information, if that's okay, with, uh, uh, with the participants today. There's a lot of interest in what you had to say. So uh, um, I'm sure this will be the beginning of a, of a, of a, of a long and productive dialogue. Um, so for the rest of us, uh, uh, please stay, please hold with us, <laughs> uh, and we're going to do some other business here. Um, we want to uh, 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 sort of get a sense of priority now that we've sort of discussed some of these things. Obviously, we didn't, we have so many issues on the table, we couldn't get to all of them in, in real detail. Uh, so we hope you've had a, you know, this is a pretty educated group, so I'm sure you have your own perspectives already, and you know a lot about these issues already, and I've had a chance to to, to read the things that we've sent you and other other things. But we want to get a sense of, of your priorities for this area because we want to make sure that the key things are really important issues. Uh, we want to make sure that we forward the right ones for final consideration on the 23rd to make it into our overall priority list, uh, which will, you know, you know, it's, it's both an important, you know, document for communications purposes to tell the world what really matters to small business, but it also helps guide our own internal work and where we put resources here at the association. Uh, so this is, this, is a, this is an important thing. So we want to ask everybody to sort of um, uh, uh, look at the issues um, and, and rank the ones that you think are the most important for you. Um, and then we'll discuss them a little bit. Um, and if, Molly, if you'll put the put the the things we want to talk about up here, I, I'm going to try to um, walk through them a little bit before people make their final um, voting decisions here. Uh, uh, so we have a, a a few things here that we the, these are obviously these are very broad categories. There's a lot that fits into each one of them, so I want to add that up up front. Um, but they tie back to the issue papers that you were all sent. One is improving access to credit. And there's lots of ways to do that. And this looks at general credit that's available in the marketplace. And are there, are there ways that the federal government can, can, can create new programs or loosen rules uh, that can, and it can improve the access of the small business community? Could be things like the proposal that Sam was talking about. Uh, it could be uh, um, if the agencies you know, change their guidance to the uh, to the to the bank regulators, the the folks that are in the banks every day, looking at what they're doing and telling them what who they can and can't lend to, essentially. Um, so that's a fairly broad category. So, so if you vote for that, that would be you know um, what would happen there. The other is SBA lending. Uh, there are lots of ways that we could expand and improve the SBA lending programs right now as well. Obviously, there's the, the PVP and IDLE programs, but there is also 
uh, uh, ways to improve the other existing SBA lending programs. There's ways to increase federal funding for them so that the fees go down or, or get eliminated and make them more accessible to more small companies. So SBA lending is only uh, um, uh, 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 what we're dealing with in that issue area. And then the, the next one is equity capital and crowdfunding. So that gets that whole bucket of things to make it easier for small businesses to get investment. Uh, of various kinds and lowering the barriers that the SEC imposes because when they're putting up um, rules, they're really thinking about big companies, well-heeled investors, and they're not thinking about the ways that a lot of small companies raise money from friends and family and don't realize that that is simple investment of $20,000 from your cousin might kick in a whole level of of reporting and paperwork they aren't even aware of. Uh, so we have to deal with that. Uh, then small business contracting, we talked about procurement here uh, a, a bit earlier and the importance of that to the small business community uh, and also um, contract lending. Uh, and then finally, one that we didn't, we didn't talk enough about, uh, but that could be really important for the whole small business economy is finally moving forward some kind of an infrastructure bill. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's the the basics of that to, to, to improve our infrastructure, which will improve our overall economy, but also the programs that uh, um, uh, that will help small businesses particularly. And so I think the other piece of this is that organizations like ours have to make sure that we are um, making sure that small businesses get lots of work under the infrastructure bills if there are ones, if there is one, excuse me. So those are the things we want you to sort of to, to, to choose from among. And I think while I've been talking here, there's been some discussion about, about whether you can vote for one or three or whatever. And Molly, will you jump in here and tell people what they're supposed to do? Because I'm not sure. Yeah, I apologize. There was a glitch with the uh, voting system. So go ahead and just select your top issue. It looks like most everybody has already done that. So it should still give us a pretty good read of, of where people's priorities are. But um, just go ahead and select your very top issue and then yeah. um, submit your results. Yeah, the instructions say three, but just um, the one. And we'll see how this turns out. Then we can chat about it a little bit. Looks like it's slowing down. Let's give it five more seconds and then we'll close the poll. Well, I, you know, by a pretty wide margin, improving access to credit was the, was the number one choice for folks um, in this with small business contracting being um, second, but a fairly distant second, uh, and fairly close behind that SBA lending programs. So, um, you know, given the, the, the overall title of the session, uh, um, you know, capital access and economic development, that's not very surprising, but I think those are the three issues that we'll want to, we'll want to forward. Um, so, you know, Marilyn, you're still here with us. And now you're back. Um, if Calvin, if you want to join us, I'm just kind of curious, uh, what's your reaction is to this and, and if this aligns with what you were thinking or, uh, your overall impressions, Marilyn, do you want to start? Sure. No, I think we covered a lot of ground with this meeting and it's important because different businesses, SEC may not have come in as a high rating based on this group. But as people are pushed out of the traditional credit markets, more and more of them are going to be yeah. looking to raising equity in some way that they can. Uh, I think the group explored the range of different ways that lending can be done. Like businesses on Main Street, they can't necessarily stand back up the way they were before. Their customers have changed, and the same with traditional banking. So I think this is an important time for us to weigh in with some thoughtful suggestions because everybody who's involved in this space is looking for answers. And if we have some, I think we'll have a date where they'll listen. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I, I, I want to echo that uh, exactly what Marilyn said, but also add that I think overall this topic is probably next to revenue growth. I think this is the most important topic for small businesses across the country, especially as we go through this entire pandemic right now 
And I've found a lot of small business owners here in the state of Louisiana, you know, that are crying out to me because I have, you know, expressed to them, if you have issues, please let me know because I can, you know, send those up to, to Congress as well as share it with you guys. And the, the access to capital, I think, has been an overall thorn in everybody's side uh, because banks are not lending right now and because they, they don't understand or know the, the uncertainties that lie before us. And when you look at the programs that Congress has put forth through the SBA, the problem is they really don't have a clue on how to administer them. And, and that's been the overall problem, as, as we all probably saw with PPP. Rules were changing almost on a weekly basis. You know, I have friends in financial institutions that, that told me that they, for a while, had to pause um, PPP lending because they didn't know what was going to happen next week with the rules. If they were lending to someone or to a, 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 a company that wouldn't be uh, eligible the next week. You know, so I think overall, uh, and I've expressed this to Todd, and, and we actually expressed this together uh, to to Congressman Graves uh, about a week ago, is that there needs to be more input from the small business community that that this, especially the small business committee is listening to on how to give access to capital to small businesses. And right now, I think that they really need to to take a step back. You know. Credit, credit right now should be out the window as far as uh, pulling someone's credit because I think, Marilyn, you may have said it or somebody else, is that small business owners have exhausted savings. They've maxed out credit cards. You know, they've, they've had to, unfortunately, miss payments on loans. So truth be told, if you had a 780 or 800 or a perfect score, Last year in February, you probably were looking at a, a, a four or five hundred credit score. So yeah, you can't go to a bank. And and you know one of the things we expressed to to uh, to Congress last last week was that look, the SBA should not be pulling credit and 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 using that as a criteria to to lend out money, especially under the the EIDL uh, process. They should go ahead, do the same as the PPP make it accessible, people understand it is a loan, and then on top of that, if you use some of that EIDL money for payroll, then use that as a grant. Instead of give the PPP, we take that money in as small business owners and we turn around and we give it to our employees. It really does nothing or help the small business owner overall. You literally took money in and gave it right back out. EIDL is, is more accessible, so I think that, you know, this topic, and, and Todd, you know, it's, it's a thorn for me uh, because, you know, access to capital, has, not just for small business owners as a whole, but also minority businesses, it has been bad. And if we really want to help move small businesses forward, because we are the driving engine of the U.S. economy with over 47, close to 50 percent of employment of, work, of the workforce, then they need to really listen and, and, and do this. So I applaud you guys for having this particular topic because this is probably the biggest thing and most important thing, I believe, for me and for all small business owners. And I think, you know, we definitely should make this one of our, if not the top priority uh, this year moving forward. Well, thanks. So, hey, Mel, what do you think? So, <laughs> So I have to tell you, Calvin, when you started with the, you know, cap access to capital is only second, is first and right after that is revenue. You know, my favorite access to capital is revenue. <laughs> like, so I love that we're bringing these two things together. I also wonder if anybody else on the call had that same kind of, I, I almost felt like I was going to start twitching, like PTSD kind of response, like I don't mean to minimize that trauma, but uh, when you were describing how, and then you, and then you, you go on your credit cards and then you, <laughs> Like, this is a very important conversation. So I'm also going to draw on something that, Marilyn, you reminded us of on uh, one of our last conversations. And it is this point that um, in a, in a, it builds off a bit of what you were saying, Calvin, about, you know, it, banks don't have some – we all have uncertainty right now. Let's just, let's just put it that way. We all have uncertainty. So what we are as small business owners is nothing but nimble or agile. What we are as entrepreneurs is people who can solve problems, look at a challenge, and in that – sort of ornery way that we have go, oh, how is this an opportunity? So this is the opportunity that we all have participating with NSBA is to help 
to help inform the people who are trying to make more certain the uncertainty. So your engagement today is just spectacular, important, and really critical to the process moving forward successfully. So Todd, back to you. Well, I just want to thank everybody for participating. I mean, this I think was a really great session. I, I, I think we could have talked all afternoon, though. There's so many things we didn't get to. Um, I sort of almost feel like we need to schedule another one or, or a series of these outside of the Small Business Congress framework uh, uh, to really begin to dig into these issues because there's a lot that people, a lot of feedback we need, but also a lot of information and education that, that the other folks need. So um, I, I think we may want to look at doing that. But But for now... Uh, thank you all. I, I want to have some other things. I want to thank Ring Central for their sponsorship and uh, uh, overall of this event and the, the provision of, of this platform for us. And they're going to have a webinar coming up on March 3rd where we're going to sort of help people understand these tools a little bit better, help all of us understand these tools a little bit better. Um, so I encourage you to sign up for that if you get the chance. And also don't forget, tomorrow we're talking about technology and trade. And the next week we are going to do the culminating event. So I, I hope everyone has signed up for those and will participate with us. Um, so uh, thank you for being here. Um, and, and thanks for all your great questions and comments. We really appreciate it. And we'll talk to you all tomorrow, I hope. <laughs> Bye, everybody.